millions of people in this world, all of them yearning, looking to others to satisfy them, yet isolating themselves. Why? Was the earth put here just to nourish human loneliness? And religious belief doesn't always help. We know that. If a person doesn't believe in God, it's certainly easy to get stuck in feeling alone as an individual. We're the most basic unit. Even with other people, we have this inner life that they will never understand, that somebody will never totally get us. But even if we believe in God, even if we can think on our own, that God, you know, even if we think that God is not there, uh, is there, we can, we can get stuck on our little issues. That God is too great to notice our struggles. That God's too big to be concerned. That God is separated, distant, and aloof. And it's easy to feel that way even as a Christian. How often do we struggle in our day to day and we feel like nobody can help us? And usually God is the last person that we turn to. That's how it is for me. But can I tell you that that isn't true? That isn't true about God. God hasn't left us alone. And God most certainly cares about our little things, our little problems in our life. That's the story that the Bible tells. From the very beginning, God was intimately concerned with His creation. The second sentence in the Bible, right after, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, is now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was ho hovering over the waters. The Hebrew word for spirit is, is ruach, which is, means the very breath of God, the life of God, God's Spirit. Even before forming the creation of God, God was intimately present. And the way Genesis describes the creation of humanity was that God formed us, formed us like a potter forms the clay, that he took the dust from the ground and formed our bodies and breathed his breath into our bodies to give us life. It was even said that God walked with his creation. But we all know the sad, tragic part of that story is that after God had created humanity, after God had created Adam and Eve, the representatives of humanity, they're told one rule, not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day, God tells them, you will surely die. And even though God walked with them, even though he walks with us, even though he spoke to them as one person to another, even though he speaks to us, they sinned. And we sin in the way we always sin with the question, did God really say? Did God really say that you should not eat from this tree? Certainly you will not die, but you will be like God. And to this day, we ask the same questions did God really say? Did God really speak? We will not die. We're masters of our own destiny. We're makers of our own past. We are as God ourselves. Kings of the wild things. Separation. Disconnection. We broke that relationship with God and we were asked only one thing. Don't do this one thing. Don't eat of this tree. Don't do it. Not because it's trivial. And not because I just want to have power over you. But because when you do it, you will certainly die. You will be separated from your life. And so we chose to be separated. To be as kings. To be individuals. To be indivisible. To be alone. And if you want proof of this in your own life, just look inside and find that one time, that one time when you did that thing that you knew was wrong, but you did it anyway. We are not so different now. But even then, 
even when Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit, even when the relationship was broken, even when they could no longer stay in Eden in paradise, when they had broken the only rule that God set before them, separating themselves from God, God does not leave us alone. No, as they're leaving, it says that he makes garments for them and that he clothes them as a father would his children. They had broken the relationship, and yet he was intimate and near and close. But we have this view that we stand separated from God, that we've chosen to be separated from God. We have sinned as Adam and Eve, and God can no longer be with us, that God has left us to live in a world apart from him. We know this. Where's God in this world? But there is always hope. And so God finds a friend in a man named Abraham. And God makes this promise to Abraham that through your descendants, I will bless the entire world. And God keeps his promise. So Abraham has many children, and those children have many children, and those children have many children, and those children have many children, and on. And God protects these people, the Israelites. God is close to these people, and it's unique. As Moses says in Deuteronomy, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? They knew this intimacy with God. God was close to them, and yet God's Spirit was also only sent on the few, the select few, this breath. This Ruach of God, this Holy Spirit was sent to the leaders, to the prophets, but not every person. God was near, but he wasn't in everyone. And one of those leaders who had this spirit was Moses, the man uh, of God who was God used to free his people, to part the seas, to give his people the law. God had chosen him not because of his greatness, but maybe in spite of it, for this was the same man who said, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Why would you choose me? And nevertheless, God's Spirit was on him. And there comes this time when Moses no longer uh, can handle being the leader alone. And so God promises to share his Spirit with many leaders. And as the Spirit comes upon them, there is this miraculous show of power. And they begin to prophesy in the way they never do again. And Joshua, Moses' aide, speaks up. He says, Moses, my Lord, stop them. Because he was worried about Moses' authority being shared. And Moses' reply is beautiful. He says, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all of the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put His Spirit on them. I wish God's Spirit was on everybody. And maybe Moses understood something of God's plan in that moment because God promised to bless all of the people on this earth. And at this time, only the select few had that intimate experience with the Holy Spirit of God, the intimacy of God, the guarantee that we are not alone. We all needed something more. And so there comes these prophecies of the Messiah, of a special person, of a Savior, of one who will do away with our sinfulness, our separation, who will make us right with God again. Someone who would somehow draw us close again to God. And it was said that the Spirit of God would be on him in a way never before. And that he would be a covenant for all of the world, an agreement between God and everyone else. And from him would come the Spirit of God on all people, It was like God was planting a seed into the ground in humanity, and when fully grown, the fruit would be offered to all of us. Life-giving fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. If it was through the eating of fruit that we are separated, it was through the eating of this fruit that we would be redeemed. And the prophet Isaiah spoke about this Savior of the world. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. 
And again in chapter 42, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he has established his justice on the earth. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your name, your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. And a hundred years later, hundreds and hundreds of years later, a child is born, born of a woman and of the Holy Spirit. He is called Jesus Christ because Jesus means God saves and Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the one on whom God's glory is. He's called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Like a seed put into the soil, Jesus grows and He performs miracles and mighty acts. And one day He goes into a synagogue, a church like this place, and He gets up to speak. And he's given the Isaiah scroll to read from, and he chooses this one passage to read from. He reads this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he tells the people, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this, he meant the Spirit. He offered himself as a way to the Spirit of God. But then this man, This Jesus, he begins to talk about leaving. He tells his followers, I must go to Jerusalem and die and suffer at the hands of the leaders, but that he'll be resurrected and he will go to heaven to make a place for those who love him. Far-fetched. Far-fetched. But he makes a promise. He says, if you love me, if you keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you. How long? Forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you, oh, you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I, I am in you. And Jesus Christ goes to His death on the cross. The death promised from the very beginning. On that day, you will surely die. And He does for our sin. But death cannot keep its hold on life. And so Jesus rises and He appears to many people and He speaks to them and He lets them touch His wounds And before he ascends into heaven, he sits down with his disciples for a meal, and this is what he says. He says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. Well, do we remember the gift that his Father had promised? Abraham, through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed. The gift Moses dreamed of, I wish God would put his Spirit on all the Lord's people. The gift the Father promised through the prophets. And afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. 
Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit into you. I will remove from your heart a stone, a heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my Spirit in you. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my Spirit in you, and you will live. Do not leave Jerusalem, he says, but wait for the gift my Father promised. For thousands of years, he promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The seed had been planted and it grew strong to bear fruit. And then they prepared to bring in a harvest. And the followers of Jesus listened. They waited in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost. This day, this day is Pentecost. And they waited there until the day of Pentecost. This day, 2,000 years ago, They were together on this day to celebrate the Jewish festival of Pentecost. Pentecost is not just about Pentecostalism. Pentecost was a Jewish festival that that had been in place for 1,500 years. And they were together. It It was a festival in the time of Moses, a festival where the first fruits of the harvest were brought to honor God. Isn't that interesting? The first fruits of the harvest were brought to honor God. And it was on this day that they were all together, the first fruits from Jesus Christ. And suddenly the sound, like the sound of a blowing of a violent wind, the ruach, the breath of God came down on all of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But this time it was different. This time it was not just for the few. This time it was not just for the leaders because of our separation had been broken by the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ had made a way. This time it was offered to all. The people who were there who saw this this Spirit come down on, on this strange group of Christians, they gathered round as Peter gets up, one of Jesus' closest followers to speak, to explain what in the world is going on. And he told them the story I am telling you today. That God had promised through his prophets to pour out his spirit on all people. And that he would show signs and wonders and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. He spoke of Christ. Of the powerful acts that we were, they were all witnesses to. And of his crucifixion and of his resurrection. And he said, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses to it. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. And it tells us that these people listening, they were cut to the heart and they asked, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter answered them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you. This promise is for your children. And for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. For all. So we are not alone. None of us. Or at least we never need to be. You know, it's easy for us to feel like nobody understands us. Nobody gets us. Like nobody can satisfy that hole inside of us. We want companionship. We want friendship. 
We want intimacy. We can all feel this way. Alone in a crowd. But there is one who is offered to be with you. He said, I will be with you until the end of the age. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. We look at the Holy Spirit like a device. Like something that gives us what we want or makes us great or is just too strange to talk about. But the Holy Spirit is a person who will never leave you, never forsake you, will always be there. It is the person who says, you are not alone. You will not be alone if you will only receive me. There is no need for you to be divided anymore. There is no need for you to stay away from me. Since the beginning of time, I cared about you. I formed you. I gave you life. And for thousands of years, I prepared a way for you to be with me. Why do you look for someone else? When I am here. Why do you go it alone when you don't need to? You were made for this. To be with me. To be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Or do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are not undivided. You are not alone. A.W. Tozer summed it up this way. He said, It will be a new day for us when we put away false notions and foolish fears and allow the Holy Spirit to fellowship with us as intimately as He wants to do, to talk with us as Christ talked to His disciples by the Sea of Galilee. After that, there can be no more loneliness, only the glory of the never-failing presence. You are not alone. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank You for this day that we remember the gift that You had promised for thousands of years. The gift of Your Holy Spirit. Father, we still to this day choose to live without You. We still to this day turn away from You and turn towards others. But God, we ask that Your Holy Spirit may convict us, may find us, may chase us down, that we may live with you, that we may never be alone again, that that hole may be filled in the only way possible for it to be filled, with your Holy Spirit. God, we ask that if anyone has not accepted your Holy Spirit, has not come to belief in you, that they may do so now, that you might give the promised gift You are a man of your word. You will do what you say. And that you might send that spirit on them when they believe. We pray, Lord Almighty, that you might be with us. Strengthen our spirits with yours. And lead us into this world. In your most blessed name we pray. Amen. place I know I know the world tells us it's to be individual to be your own person there's, there's something that's not that's okay with that but there's something about coming together in the community of Christ and the spirit that leads us together there's power in that when we unite when we worship our God when we work together for the greater good of his kingdom we've all been there we've all needed compassion we've all needed love we've all needed someone to hold our hand through something or someone to laugh with And our God has provided that through His Spirit and through the people that surround us. So this morning, we want to take what He's given us and share it with the world. We sing. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. The kindness of a Savior, the 
hope of nations. 